everybody, welcome to my homestead, welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to I want to go over some entries on the common misconceptions spreadsheet that I put together that I haven't covered yet on the channel. Um, these two misconceptions have been bothering me since the very beginning of the channel. They probably bother you as well. Um, I think what happens is sometimes people come over to the channel uh, just randomly, you know, it's recommended to them, their LDS, and so they see a video, and then they say something like this. Well, we can't really know when it's going to happen, talking about the second coming. It could be now or 100 years from now, right? We just have no way of knowing when it's going to happen, and therefore, it's not really worth the effort, right? Or sometimes maybe you... You know, you guys have friends, you recommend a, a video to them, and then they watch it, and they're like, yeah, but... <laughs> you know, and then they leave a comment uh, that blurts out something like this. The other one is, uh, we shouldn't watch for the signs of the second coming. We should focus only on the here and now, right? That's all that we can really... Um, have any control over so it's not worth watching the signs of the second coming and both of these are false these are false okay and interestingly most of what i'm going to go over here is from the scriptures themselves on the channel up until this point i've heavily heavily relied on uh quotations from or quotes from uh presidents of the church apostles general authorities so on uh, because a lot of times they clarify what the scriptures are, are saying, especially when it comes to future events, prophecies, which are not so clear. Other things are pretty darn clear. You don't really need uh, anybody to back it up because it's just there's really only one way you can read it. So I still do it, though. I still do it. So <clears throat> here we go. Let's just go through the list, shall we? So this for this first one, the under the pink uh, highlighted areas. We can't really know when it's going to happen. It could be now or 100 years from now. There's no way for us to know. So for Matthew 24, verses 32 to 33, it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know the summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Okay. So, yeah, we, we really can know. Yes. And no, it can't just be now or 100 years from now. I mean, now, yes. Yes. Now, yes. But 100 years from now, that's up for debate, of course. But uh, I'm pretty sure if you're watching this channel, you we're kind of on the same page that it could happen anytime between now and maybe 10 years from now, generally speaking. Okay, the next one. Okay, this is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say, when they shall say peace and safety. And by the way, the same people that say this, we can't really know when it's going to happen seem to be the same people that say peace and safety. Okay, so, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Okay, so because we're watching and we know what to expect, right, we're not going to be taken by surprise. In fact, this is, we're told right here, let us watch. That's what, that's what we're instructed to do, is to watch. So that we're not taken as a thief in the night. Okay, what's the next one? Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, verses 39 to 40. That says, Even so it shall be in the day 
when they shall see all these things, then shall they know <coughs> that the hour is nigh. So when all these things are happening, they shall know that the hour is nigh. And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, so he that is fearing me, the Lord, shall be looking for the second coming. And they shall see signs and wonders for uh, they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the, in the earth beneath. And uh, that's the primary purpose of my channel is to watch for these signs and wonders. And there have been many recently. Okay, now uh, we're going on to a general authority. This is Bernard P. Brockbank, assistant to the Council of the Twelve, a position that no longer exists. Um, but in 1976, it did. This is the April General Conference of that year. He says, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, certain promised signs and wonders are to take place, making it possible for his saints to know the approximate time of his coming. They're given for a reason. There are signs, and the signs are meant to inform you, inform people that are actually believe it, and people that are watching, to let them know, hey, it's going to happen soon. Be ready. Okay, the next one, this is from Bruce R. McConkey in The Millennial Messiah. Uh, pop this out. Okay. The second coming is as a woman about to give birth to a child. She and her husband, the midwife at her side, and all who are informed know the birth is near. But they do not know the day and the hour. Even when the pains commence, they cannot know what minute uh, the expected one shall arrive. The approximate time, the times and the seasons, yes, but not the, not the, sorry, yes, but the precise, the precise time, no, but ye, sorry, but ye, brethren, Paul continues, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You, ye are the children of light and the children of the day. Ye are not of the night nor of darkness. Of course, we, we just read that. Okay. And the, la the last one for this, for this misconception, also from Millennial Messiah, Bruce R. McConkey. He says, For our, pre our present purposes, it suffices to know that the children of the light shall know, not the day or the hour, but the approximate time of the Lord's return. This approximate time can certainly be narrowed down to a generation. It can be narrowed down to a generation. Okay, so what was the misconception? We can't really know when it's going to happen. It could be now or 100 years from now. No, that is false. That is absolutely false. And we looked at what Bruce R. McConkie said about generations and what Joseph Smith said about the generation that will see the second coming. You remember that, right? Let's go over to this uh, timeline. Rising Generation. I'm going to zoom out. So, Bruce R. McConkie, based on something that Joseph Smith said during a discourse. Let's see. Back in 1843, on uh, January, or sorry, the 6th of April, Joseph Smith says, were I, were I going to prophesy, I would say the end of the world would not come in 1844, 5 or 6, or in 40 years. There are those of the rising generation who shall not taste death till, till Christ comes. And about that, Bruce R. McConkie basically said that that would include anyone then living in their offspring. And, <clears throat> and he said that that generation should live uh, beyond the year 2000 and and so forth. And so we, we did it. You know, I put down here hypothetical situation. You have a parent that was uh, an infant at the time that that was said. You go on through time. Say that that person has a child at 40 years old. Okay. Um, 
and then you get to 1923. That person has a grandchild. I can't remember how it was said. I did a video about it, but just, just trust me. It just so happens that President Nelson fits this bill, essentially. He was born in 1924, okay? His generation definitely could be and probably is that generation that Joseph Smith is talking about. Sorry, I can't articulate it very well here, but I've done a video. Just go back. You can find it. Um, and many of you have pointed out that uh, you have people that where the father uh, was having children really late into his life, especially if he had a polygamous family. You know, in fact, it was said that uh, I think it was Joseph F. Smith had a child uh, when he was uh, 80 or he was like 79 or 80 years old. And he had a child with a younger woman. So generations can really stretch over a long period of time. They really can. Uh, okay, so that, that's enough of that. Let's go back to uh, the misconceptions, common misconceptions. Okay. Now let's go on to this. And I've heard other Christians complain about this as well. Christians that are looking for the signs of the times that expect the second coming. They have people that go to their channels too and say the same things that they do on, on this channel. The next one is, <clears throat> we shouldn't watch for the signs of the second coming. We should focus only on the here and the now. Because, you know, that we're just uh, looking for things that we don't need to be worrying about. We're all distracted, so we shouldn't be watching. Okay, well, I'll see what it says in the scriptures. Let's see what it says in my Bible. It says here, Joseph Smith Matthew uh, 46 to 48, which, of course, Joseph Smith Matthew, that's... Uh, Matthew 24. It's like a, a Joseph Smith translation of that. It says, okay, let me pop it out. What I say unto one, I say unto all men, watch therefore, for you know not at what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. It would not have suffered his house to have been broken up but he would have been ready. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So Christ himself is telling us, watch, therefore, watch. Because if you had been watching, then you'd be ready. Right? Compared to someone that, that isn't watching. That says that we shouldn't watch. Uh, the next one... Matthew 25, <coughs> sorry, Matthew 25, verse 13. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Luke 12, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, whom the Lord when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to read that again. It, I uh, copied it because in, ver okay, in verse uh, 6, it says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. DNC 4544. And then... They shall look for me, and behold, I will go. <coughs> Sorry. <sighs> Sorry. And then they shall look for me, okay, because they're watching. And behold, I will come. And they shall see me in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. And he that watches not for me shall be cut off. He that watches not for me shall be cut off. That's pretty serious. Uh, I'm pretty sure none of us want to be cut off. So maybe we should listen to Christ and watch. Okay, section 50, verses 45 to 46. And the day cometh that ye shall hear my voice and see me and know that I am. 
Watch, therefore, that ye may be ready. Even so, amen. I have to delete the B right here in front of ready. It's I, I copied and pasted it in from uh, the church website. So I copied over the footnotes to the, the annotation. You guys, um, I could I could maybe, well, no, I can't. E even if you're not a member of this church and you're just like a Christian from another church, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. If you're familiar with your Bible, then you should know that we're expected to watch for the second coming. Okay, there's no excuse. And then on top of that, us as Latter-day Saints, look at the name of our church. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Latter day, the last days. The name of our church has encoded in it a warning to the world that we're in the last days. It, it's it's just it's unbelievable. But it's not, you know, because we've talked about this before on the channel. Who are the type of people that think this way? Well, I think there's probably a variety of different reasons that somebody would say this. There's probably maybe some good people that just haven't really thought about it. And then they realize, oh, wait a minute. Yes, I should be watching. But I'm going to I'm going to guess if we had like a pie chart, I'm going to guess that the vast majority of people are those uh, that say these kind of things are the ones are very uh, materially minded. Right. They're just they're just living in the here and now. They're focused on their next uh, cruise in the Caribbean. Or maybe if, you know, they make a lot this year, it's going to be a Mediterranean cruise. Um, they're looking forward to the next uh, camping trip, buying some ATVs. You know, they're just having a good time. You know, they're advancing in their career and they're, you know, whatever. People that are just living in the here and the now uh, that are focused on worldly things. Right. We've talked about the people that uh, may have a really good thing going on for them. And so they don't want it to end. And they don't have a, a lot of those people probably don't have a good understanding of the second coming. and don't realize it's going to be amazing. And so they think that everything's going to come to an end and uh, be worse for them. Right. And so they, they just don't want to think about it. They put it off way, way into the future. No, 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 that's not going to happen to me. I've got plans. I've got retirement plans. I've been working really hard for this retirement and I'm going to enjoy it. Right. And then there's yet another group of people that probably realize that they're not going to make it, that they're classified among the wicked. Okay. We're talking about the tares, the people in church that are living a celestial lifestyle. Those that and there there's different types of them there's some of them that are just like pretty obvious it's pretty clear that they're living a, a telestial lifestyle they don't really make too much effort to cover it up and yet they still come to church uh, you have other ones that kind of mix in better and the stuff that they do their telestial behavior is uh just in their private life away from you know church eyes i guess and then you have those that that are you know, they make their way up in the church and uh, they're just living just a two faced uh, existence where they knowingly like they, they they put on the the LDS costume because it benefits them in some kind of way, whether maybe it's because they're they're really good at getting attention. Uh, they, they just like have a knack for being LDS, you know, having the LDS costume. And so they get attention. Uh, they have influence that way. You, you think about people. Think about people that you've seen in your life that uh, get all frustrated about not getting certain callings, right? Why would you? Why in the world would you care whether you are called to be the Relief Society president or the bishop or the elders' quorum president? Why? Like, you think that that's owed to you? Well, if you're playing that game, then yeah, I guess you do. You're like, well, I got to I gotta rise up the ranks. I got to progress in my spiritual career. And they're doing it to benefit themselves, to be, to like raise themselves up in the eyes of the, in the eyes of the community, right? 
So there's there's like a whole spectrum. But if you're one of these people that deep down you know that you're probably not going to make it because behind the scenes uh, you're a crappy person and you do horrible things. You manipulate people. You lie. Uh, you um, break the commandments. You, you're always justifying things. Then it's probably an uncomfortable thought to think about the second coming because deep down, even though you try and justify it to yourself, you know that you'd be among those people that would be swept off the earth. So why would you want to talk about that? I know it's not fun to think about, but it's the truth. And that's, that's the position that some people find themselves in. Now, just as a quick reminder, yeah, for you and me, I don't think it's possible for us to know the day and the hour, but what did we, what did we find out about the prophet? This is from Joseph Smith himself. <coughs> this was printed in the Ensign, the August 2002 Ensign. This is a quote from Joseph Smith. Did Christ speak this as a general principle throughout all generations? Oh no, he spoke in the present tense. No man that was then living upon the footstool of God knew the day or the hour. But he did not say that there was no man throughout all generations that should not know the day or the hour. No, for this would be in flat contradiction with other scripture. For the prophet says that God will do nothing but what he will reveal unto his servants, the prophets. Consequently, if it is not made known to the prophets, it will not come to pass. Okay, so the prophet, and again, I feel like we were given kind of a a hint about this during the Christmas devotional, where uh, it was Elder oh, freaking a, Elder uh, Anderson, LDS Elder. I feel like look at the face. Yeah, Elder Neil L. Anderson. He spoke. And he basically, you know, that whole devotional was basically, it was talking about Christ's first coming. But they, the way that they were talking, they were applying it to the second coming. Like everything that they were saying. And in his talk, he, he was like, hey, remember what happened the first time? Uh, they were given like a five-year warning, but they didn't know the exact day. But then the day before Christ came into the world, before he was born, uh, he appeared to the prophet Nephi the day before. And why did he do that? It's because it's a test. We're being tested. So, and I'm assuming that something similar has happened uh, in our church. I think that President Nelson and others probably have received that five or 10 or 15 year warning, whatever it is. And so they know that we're getting closer and closer and closer. And it's like, okay, he's he has to come at least by this time. So we better do this, 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 and this. You know, and I feel like that's why we've seen so many changes in the church. So many things that are preparing for a transition. And I feel like one of those big things is what's happened in the temple. That's going to make it easy, a lot more easy for new people coming into the church and getting their endowments for the first time. It just makes sense. You remember that video? We went through all the different things and pointed out how all these different changes would make it easier uh, for people to come into the church and then also at the same time to free up uh, manpower, you know, priesthood holders to be able to uh, do a lot of baptisms, confirmations, working in the, in the temple, so on and so forth. There's been a lot of restructuring. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's been some kind of like 10-year warning or, or something to that effect. But anyway, according to Joseph Smith, the prophet is going to know. And for all we know, maybe he knows right now. That's why we have to take everything that he says seriously. I mean, we should take it seriously anyway, but just... Even that that much more serious, the fact that he's going to know when the second coming is going to happen. Okay. So, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> so there's that. I wanted to look at a couple other things. Um, 
Okay, so Israel 365. Kabbalist. Earthquakes are a warning to governments. Take care of your people or else. I don't even know what this is going to say, but let's take a look at it. Look, let's look at earthquakes from a Jewish point of view. And then after that, I want to look at a little bit of this article, uh, predicting dictatorship. Ex-Prime Minister Barack says citizens may need to disobey leaders. <laughs> that's, okay, that's pretty serious. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see what it says here. Last month, an earthquake on the border of Syria and Turkey killed over 4,700 people. Since that catastrophic event, almost 8,000 aftershocks have shaken the region. Many felt in Israel. A Jerusalem Kabbalist weighing it, weighed in, suggesting that the catastrophe was a divine warning. Okay, so you guys, we don't have to be involved in Kabbalah, and we shouldn't because it's a Jewish you know, practice. It's not part of our religion. But I think we would do well to uh, see what the Jews are thinking, especially the Jews in Israel. So if you have them thinking, hey, um, this is a warning to us, it probably is. It probably is a warning to them. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. A 4.5 magnitude earthquake centered off the coast of Lebanon was felt in Israel on Wednesday morning, marking the second time this week Israel was shaken. The epicenter was 18 kilometers below sea level, some 81 kilometers northwest of the Israeli coastal city of Nahariya. The tremor was reportedly felt by residents mostly in the north of the country, but no injuries or damages were reported as a result of the tremor. This follows a 6.4 magnitude earthquake that hit Turkey, the Turkey-Syrian border region on Monday. Uh, that earthquake was also felt in Israel. Six people were killed in Turkey. So that's talking about this week, you guys. This week, there was that, that like second earthquake in Turkey. Uh, this was the one that was right by uh, the ancient city of Antioch. Now it's called uh, Antakya or something like that. But also one, uh, but I mean, be, these are being felt in Israel. Okay. 7,930 aftershocks have shaken the region since the first devastating 7.8 earthquake on February 6th. More than 600,000 apartments and 150,000 commercial premises, uh, premises, I don't know, uh, had suffered at least moderate damage. The death toll from the from the earthquake has reached over 47,000. <coughs> Let's see what it says on Wikipedia. Let's see. Uh, 2023 earthquakes Wikipedia. I just want to see if they have if they've updated their number. So, oh my gosh, they did. They're saying that uh, the death toll is now 50 thousand over 50,000 holy crap um okay well i guess i'm gonna update my earthquake tracker unfortunately okay so what do we got okay so copy over here, paste. Let's see. There was that other earthquake. Oh, yeah, this right here. <coughs> death, death toll 13. So I got to add that. Okay, give me a second. 5978 plus 13. So it's 5991 for over here for the total death, death toll. 59. 991. Okay, so it, yeah, that's just getting more and more serious. Oh my gosh. Still don't think it's going to go all the way up to 87,000. Uh, but it, this is like the biggest, like the most deadly earthquake in quite a while. You have to go back to 2010 to find a deadlier earthquake. 
Many of the aftershocks were felt in Israel. Rabbi Avraham Shira has been a student and teacher of Jewish mysticism for close to three decades at Yeshivat HaMekubalim Nahar Shalom in Jerusalem. So Jewish mysticism is talking about Kabbalah. And the Zohar is, is one of the books of Kabbalah. Quote, the Zohar teaches that there are nine rivers that come down from heaven, and each one has its own crocodile in charge. Rabbi Shira said, emphasizing that the text was speaking in metaphors. Uh, quote, there's another crocodile, the tenth, that is the biggest crocodile of them all. The Zohar is describing the pathways through which the powers of darkness and evil come into the world. <clears throat> Rabbi Shira explained that according to the Zohar, these ministering angels of darkness, uh, quote, shake their flippers. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Gosh, come on, Jared. Pull it together. <sighs> these ministering angels of darkness shake their flippers. What <laughs> Wow, that sounds terrifying. Once every 70 years, generating an earthquake in the region, or, uh, generating an earthquake in the region they rule over. The Zo quote, the Zohar is teaching us about a primordial force, an energy structure that God uses in interacting with the world. Uh, this was imagery that people could understand. Today, scientists have different names for energies affecting the world, but it is still a description of how God interacts with the natural world. Um, the Zohar is teaching us that God is active in the world, controls nature and evil actions, even more power to give the dark influence, influences that can destroy the world. God is not vengeful in the way that people are vengeful. God mirrors, mirrors, us, mirrors us back at us and recorrects the balance of things, sometimes using earthquakes. If we understand that, uh, we can do teshuva or repent and fix the balance ourselves. We don't have the vision or understanding to judge ourselves or others accurately, but we need to try. And thankfully, God is much more merciful than any man would be. Um, okay, so I think we'll just end it there. But I don't know. It's interesting that earthquakes are being felt in Israel. Okay, let's do one last thing here. I want to see what... Uh, Ehud Barak, he used to be the Prime Minister of Israel. I want to see what he has to say about um, the changes that they're making to the government. And these are not just small changes, okay? So this is not just like, whatever. Again, imagine if the United States was trying to take away power. Like, say that the President and the Congress right now uh, being controlled by one party. Imagine that they were trying to take away power from the Supreme Court, right? Because the Supreme Court <clears throat> has some power. Um, it's all a system of checks and balances. All the branches have uh, can check each other's uh, power so that things don't get out of line. So what's happening in Israel is they're trying to reduce the, the checking power of the judicial branch. Okay, so... I'm not going to use any examples. I'm not going to say liberals or conservatives or Republicans or Democrats. Let's say that there was like some party that suddenly emerged. Let's just call it the yellow party. And all of a sudden the yellow party, uh, which has a very um, deep religious conviction, you know, they get into office, they control Congress and they control the presidency. And now they're like, okay, you know what, Supreme Court, uh, you are kind of a problem, and we're going to change you. We, you need to stop interfering with what we want to do. That that's, seems to be what's happening right now in Israel. And why is that important? It's because the people that are in power, they have a, a religious uh, reason for doing things. They, they have a... a Basically, the people that are that are backing Netanyahu are the ultra orthodox. And what do they want? They want all of Israel to to be under Israeli control, right? <coughs> Let's go to uh, Israel right now. 
the map. Uh, if they had it their way, come on, load. I think, my understanding is that if they had it their way, <laughs> there would be no West Bank. I don't know about the Gaza Strip, but they, they want all their territorial land back. The same land and territory that they had in the Bible, right? So if they take away power from uh, the high court in Israel, it's called the high court over there, uh, they can probably do a whole lot more things, which would, which would agitate the Palestinians and the rest of the Arab world. And then uh, they may even do things over here in regards to the temple, you know, and it'd probably go slowly. But for example, maybe they would start allowing Jews to pray on the Temple Mount, which right now they're not allowed to do. But uh, even though you have the, the Jordanian Waqf, which uh, administers this site, the, the Temple Mount, maybe Israel would be like, well, you know, just go ahead. We're not going to we're not going to stop <clears throat> Jews from praying on the, the Temple Mount anymore. In fact, we're going to defend them. We're going to have Israeli police defend them. And, uh, well, actually, you know what? Come to think of it, why don't we just go ahead and take the Temple Mount and build the temple? Because that's what we're trying to do. That may seem kind of extreme. Uh, I don't know if that's what would happen, but there's all sorts of possibilities. If you take away checks and balances and you have, you know, the ultra-Orthodox that are at the wheel, who knows what's possible? So, former, let's see, we'll zoom in. Former Prime Minister Ehud Barak warned on Thursday that Israel was weeks away from descending into a dictatorship due to the hardline government's push to upend the judiciary, adding that people would be duty bound to refuse orders by an illegitimate regime. Yikes. I mean, for, for all I know, maybe this could lead to civil war. I, I don't know. Could you imagine that? Civil war in Israel? Let's say that civil war breaks out. I don't I, I don't know. I'm not an expert. But like if civil war breaks out, uh, what I've noticed with civil wars is usually you have outside players that get in on the action. And they support one side or the other. Right? So, for example, um, well, famously, with, uh, well, sorry, that wasn't a civil war. Um, in the American Civil War, let's see, American Civil War, Confederates supported by Britain. Is that not the case? <clears throat> Okay, the United Kingdom of the United C Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland remained officially new neutral throughout the American Civil War. It legally recognized the belligerent status of the. I'll be careful. I, I certain things you can't say, but of the other side of the war, but never recognized it as a nation, and neither signed <laughs> with it, nor ever exchanged ambassadors. I'm pretty sure that the British supported the other side british support during the civil war in may 1861 the british government issued a declaration of neutrality to signify its official stance on the american civil war the declaration recognized the confederacy status as a belligerent faction uh, but not as a sovereign nation despite this lack of rec recognition jefferson davis and other southern leaders were confident in their ability to secure support from britain and other foreign powers they relied both on conventional diplomatic lobbying and, and on more controversial policies such as the withholding of cotton which is the south's main export to britain through these tactics southern leaders hoped to force both political and popular opinion in europe to support the their cause um, historians have long debated the success of their attempts to influence British opinion. Many have argued that political and class alle allegiances determined British support for neither the North or the South. Okay, whatever. But 
for you that are history buffs, I, I'm pretty sure there's been civil wars. Well, look, look at this, for example. Okay, just north, just north of Israel, you have Syria, civil war, and you have uh, the Russians that are trying to um, prop up the old regime, right? Uh, keep Assad in power. Uh, but you have other uh, people here too. You have the U.S. that's been here in Syria um, and stuff like that. So what I'm trying to get at is if something like that happens to Israel, you know, if there, if a civil war breaks out, most likely other countries are going to get involved. It probably won't remain strictly a civil war. Okay. Just within the country itself. So, and, uh, I get the feeling that there's a lot of people I think that were dismayed when, uh, when during the the Six Day War, when Israel captured Jerusalem, and famously there there was a thing where there uh, there's like a recording of soldiers that that took the Temple Mount and they're like we have the Temple Mount we have control of the Temple Mount. I think a lot of people back then were hoping oh oh my gosh we have Jerusalem we have the old city now now we're going to be able to build the temple but that never happened. And so what happens this time if there's like a civil war? Maybe they'll be like, okay, we're going to get it right this time and we're going to take it. I don't know. These are all just crazy situations, but it could happen. Okay, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak warned on Thursday that Israel was weeks away from descending into a dictatorship due to the hardline government's push to upend the, the judiciary, adding that the people would be duty-bound to refuse orders by a an illegitimate regime regime. Okay. So according to him, just weeks away, and that's because of like the schedule that they have of going over these bills. Okay. Speaking at a conference hosted by the left-leaning Israeli news daily, Haaretz Barak, a former defense minister, oh, sorry, Barak, a former def defense minister and IDF chief of staff said Israel was facing quote unquote, the gravest, national crisis since the outbreak of the war in, in 1948 after it declared its independence and now we're just becoming a quote-unquote de facto dictatorship if the hard right coalition led by prime minister benjamin netanyahu completes its completes its plans to impose radical sweeping changes to the judiciary system these include grant granting itself total control over the appointment of judges, including to the high court, all but eliminating the high court's ability to review and strike down legislation, <clears throat> and allowing politicians to appoint and fire their own legal advisors. The plans have spurred mass weekly protests in major cities, alarming, uh, alarmed, okay, alarmed warnings from economists, legal professionals, and tech entrepreneurs inside and outside Israel, and fierce criticism from the opposition. After the Knesset, okay, someone corrected me. You know what, I need a, I'm going to make a new tab. I'm going to call this tab, um, let's call it pronunciation. Pronunciation. And uh, we're going to do Knesset. And then we'll do Knesset. That's the correct pronunciation. And we'll play a little game, shall we? Let's do a little game. So this one I lost. I lost because I was pronouncing it Knesset. And so I'm going to color this red. Okay, but what I did get right was Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, there we go, Beetlejuice. Someone told me that this was not pronounced Beetlejuice, but it is. B tall juice, Beetlejuice, and this one I won. So it's going to be green. 
Okay. In fact, let's see how how do you pronounce Betelgeuse? Oh, I almost okay. I almost had that the way that they did it. Sorry, everybody. Beetle juice. This is that. This is the star that's like the right shoulder of Orion, the constellation Orion. So I was right, but I was not right about Knesset. Well, let, you know what? Let me. I haven't. Okay, let's let's find out. Maybe I was right. Knesset. How do you pronounce Knesset? Knesset. Freaking a. Okay. Fine. Fine. Knesset. Whatever. Well, how about we just, uh, why don't we just spell it this way? How about that? Since we have letters that make words, and each letter has a sound that's assigned to it, how about we just spell it the way that it's uh, supposed to be, the way that it sounds? Okay. No, how is it right? And then go like that. I'll make this night better later, but I anticipate more wins. Okay, after the Knesset passed initial votes on the legislation on Tuesday, marking the first significant steps in its divisive effort to shake up the judiciary, the shekel depreciated to the weakest level in three years against the U.S. dollar, and Tel Aviv shares declined. Warnings from the country's uh, top economic figures about the potentially significant economic fallout followed on Thursday, but Netanyahu and other top officials continued to, to brush the predictions aside. Barack, a fierce critic of Netanyahu and of the overhaul to the ju judiciary, said, uh, quote, the danger is immediate and real, and that it may take two weeks, three weeks, to turn us essentially into a de facto dictatorship like Hungary or Poland. Following Barack's comments, the Likud party filed a complaint against him with the police accusing him of incitement to violence, pushing calls to violence, and harming the government and public order in the country. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm not going to read. Oh yeah, look at this. He accused Netanyahu's government of pursuing a coup d'etat and said the overhaul plan was an attack to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's that that's synonymous or that's about the same as saying a, a, an attack on the constitution because the, their laws, I guess, are based off of the declaration of independence. They don't have a constitution. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on this because I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a nothing burger. It doesn't sound like it. Whenever you adjust what a, a government can do, um, that's typically kind of, typically kind of serious. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But, uh, yeah. All right. Well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you.